people speak, let them go over the radio. Let them say what they want to say. If you are not satisfied, engage them in a debate. The idea of political tolerance is to persuade people to follow you, not to brutalize them into keeping quiet. And brutalized people who keep quiet are very dangerous people. Because whatever happens, they will stand aside and see you doing battle with those who want to get at you. The more involved the people are, the more we engage them, the better, the better. So I will say, open up the democratic space. Let the people discuss. I think the Chinese said something like, let a, let a, let a hundred flowers blossom, let a thousand schools of thoughts contain. Let them say what they want to say over the radio, over the FM, in the Hatai Center. I spoke to the Swedish ambassador. He said, if you have one desire, what will you ask me to do? I said, I will beg you to find money and build three or four libraries in Liberia and stack them with books and documents so our people can read, so they can argue from informed perspective. So let them talk. It is their country. If they are conscious and go to the polls, if they want to gamble with the destiny, that is their responsibility. Let them answer to the children. I hope, I hope, for the sake of the Republic, my people and my children, I hope I have not gambled wrongly. So far, I do not think I've gambled wrongly. I thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Pamela, thank you very much for the elaborate and wonderful presentation that you just made to us. First of all, I was very impressed by your depth of knowledge and understanding of the struggle here in Africa for freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Secondly, I was also inspired by your passion for what you believe. And thirdly, your honesty to accept responsibility for what you did after 1980 and not pass the buck, but rather be willing to work in rebuilding and changing things for the better. I also agree with you that historically, a time had come in history where change was inevitable. Our only point of difference may be the methodology of that change. So my first question has to do with the point that do you believe that um, the methodology of change can affect the influence of the change at the end? For example, we had a change that involved a violent revolution. Whereas there have been other historical examples of revolution. We compare the Russian Revolution, which was about the French Revolution rather, which was violent and bloody, with the so-called Glorious Revolution of England, which was more a passive but yet focused change. So would you like to comment on that? I mean, could there have been another option? for our Liberian change or the so-called African perspective. Especially when I look at the issue that in 1982, there was scheduled an election, which meant within about three years. And already the Tui party system, confronted with the global issue of um, respect for human rights, the United Nations, and all the other pressure, the battle against the communist forces, had sort of made, and then especially the death of Todman himself, had reached us to a point where it seemed that automatically that process of change could have come if it had been properly balanced and channeled with the right ideology and vision of leadership. So could you please give us a little discussion on that possibility or prospects? I follow what you're saying. You see, the methodology used in terms of violence <clears throat> who was not brought about by those who were agitating for change. I'm glad you mentioned that an election was scheduled for 1982. So I go back and say, and I quote Albert Port, who is an authority on this, since we're dealing with a hypothetical situation, 
So what happens if the government of Tolbert had listened to Albert Post? What happened is the, the police had not opened fire on April 14, 1979. What happened if the Talbot government had only said, let them demonstrate, let them go ahead. They are naughty boys. Let me give them some, if I give them the police ban, let them march to the streets of Morocco. <laughs> so what would have happened? I ask you, those who were agitating, I made it quite plain that we had analyzed the situation. We were focusing on the election of 1982. And we had our forces in place. We knew that, and we were being very practical politicians. The leader of our movement, Dr. Tipote, was from the Southeast, had grown up in Morovia. On the other side, Dr. Reverend Tyre was from Nimba County. This was an amalgamation of the Cry and the Mendemel group with a scattering of people from Morovia who believe in our politics, who felt there was a need for change. Like the young men and women who had gone to the Bikiana Congress of the Tui Party and had demanded that certain changes be made within the structure of the Tui Party to reflect the ethnic balance of this group. So what would have happened if the Tui Party had listened to Alba Port and refused to have a confrontation to show that it was in power. What would have happened? It's possible that there wouldn't have been a violent change. It is possible that Mr. Talbot would have retired in 1982 after presiding over an election. And let me be bold to say, it would have been possible that Moja would have won a free and open election and the process of social transformation would have continued and there wouldn't have been any bloodshed. So you see, historical hypotheses can be, can be very fluid, they are volatile. What are we talking about here? We are not talking about young men and women who consciously say we need violence. Although some of us had read Hegel, we understood lordship and bondage. We understood, we understood the passage we had read, The Force of Violence in History by Franz Fanon. Bismarck, the politics of iron and steel, we had read all of that. But the Liberian society was not developed to that level. I think what sparked, what sparked this gamble for the winning of support was the fact that PAL was taking advantage of the possibility of mobilizing people around the rice demonstration. Moja was on its way to register a political party to begin to agitate for 1982. I think with the reality in a society, the students at the University of Liberia demanding changes at Cottonton, students asking to be heard, I think the panic came from within the two party. Men who had not been used to this kind of confrontation, which was moderate, moderate, but any stretch of the imagination. People acting within the confines of the constitution. No group had arms, Paul did not. When they transformed into PPP, they had no arms. Moja had no arms. I sit here, I can state categorically. So, what happened? Who introduced the question of armed violence into Liberian politics? Was it true party? Was it true party? And after they introduced the armed violence, they miscalculated. For the soldiers they were depending on, since, since, realized that with the guns, they could go one step further. They could take power. Why they brought us in? Because they were looking for legitimacy. We are the people agitating for democratic transformation. We were the people on the line talking about opening up the democratic space. Allow the people the right to choose the leaders. My movement, Moja, had even gone to the extent of putting forward Barrow Sawyer as a mayor, a mayor or candidate. We wanted to test the system to see whether they had in place the mechanism for free and fair elections. Of course, they aborted the elections. So, yes, it would have been good. It would have been good if, of course, we did not have the violent response. If we had leadership material that realized that in dealing with aggrieved people, you can use water cannons. You can use pepper spray. You don't have to use life ammunition. When you put the people
people's children in the mortuary and they see the dead bodies of the children they only pray to God that your time will come <laughs> that's all they can do so I throw, I throw the question back to the learned commissioner do you think the methodology of the two party moving towards election the transformation of the regional and international system do you think do you think that if the leadership had exercised the tolerance the patience and the understanding it could not have handled the demonstration and save us from the tragedy that we experience if this was the enlightened party if this was a party of men who were conscious of their responsibility to society why they show of force why they show of force what did you want to demonstrate what did you want to demonstrate the various wars you fought in this country were different wars you were successful yet but this was a different time in history so what were you trying to show it was their desire to show that they could control power and let me say this I remember very well after the rice riot there was this talk again Mr. Talbot by certain elements of the oligarchy of the two-way party that he was weak he was not decisive enough and the son of one of such men said to Dr. Zamba Liberty my father says Talbot is weak what we need to do is to carry out a massacre or a few of these rabble rousers, noise makers, and we can hold this thing for our children for the next 50 years. So I'm convinced that they were trying to prove a point. That this agitation for them was not confrontational. It was annoying because of the arrogance. So they would teach these upstarts a lesson. They would teach these jigger please a lesson. Sons and daughters of peasants, how dare you request to have a share in power in the republic. This was the mentality. And so go out there, shoot them, bury them. They're poor people's children. They only have money to go to funeral homes. Who's going to bother with them? So you came out and you kill people. Once you address the political issue by violence, you were yourself in the eye of the storm. And that came a year later. How do you blame us for that? How do you blame those who are agitating for the rights of the people to vote? We didn't bring the soldiers on the streets. We didn't train the soldiers. You did. You did. And that is why a leadership must be wise. A leadership is leadership is not by dressing, but only by dressing in white, waving, waving a stick in your hands. <laughs> That's not leadership. It's in understanding the tempo of the society, where your people are going, what they believe in. And I am convinced, beyond all reasonable doubt, beyond all reasonable doubt, and I say this here with all sincerity, on the morning of April 14, 1979, if Mr. Talbot had said to Mr. Albert Port, I will accompany you to these people. These are children. These are little boys. What do they understand? I will accompany you and I will discuss with them. And what I will do? They say they can bring rice for so so price. I will give them ten thousand dollars. Let's bring rice, let's see. Oh, you want to demonstrate? Go ahead. Go ahead. But if your supporters behave unruly, you are going to be irresponsible. That would have been it. It would have been it. A brother said, he said, yeah, well, probably they should have called us and given us jobs. No moja were not after jobs. We wanted power to transform the society. That's why we're fighting for the elections. So I'm saying, yeah, it would have been a good thing for, us to, for all of us to go to our churches, to our mosques, to our schools, to our homes, and nobody gets on the streets, and there will be peace. Since history does not give people the luxury of deciding which action to take. If you blunder in history, sometimes you pay dearly for your blunder. And this was happening to the two-way party. Now, if you ask me, do you regret the two-way party falling from power? 
Is there a hungry man who ever regrets the opening of a store for free food? <laughs> Politi politically, 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 we'll have to do more study of the two-way party. More study of the two-way party. So to the Honorable Commissioner, I say, I understand your argument about methodology. I would have rather the two-way party had wiser men, or the two-way party had listened to the young people at the Buchanan Congress, had carried out the necessary changes, had embraced the people of this country. And if Mr. Talbot was bold and decisive enough, he would have thrown his lot with the people and not be dragged into the depths of conservatism by the old guards who wanted no change who were not in favor of change. So if you like, Mr. Talbot was a sacrificial lamb. In history, in history, we do not recognize good intentions. Practical deals are what matter, not good intentions. You can be Jesus Christ. That's sad. Uh, it's not for nothing he hasn't come back after 2,000 years. <laughs> Good intentions are one thing. Practical reality is another. Mr. Talbot, for some people who says, Mr. Talbot was a good man. He had good ideas, good intentions. Poor Mr. Talbot. After Tuckman, history did not give you that luxury. Did not give you that luxury. Of keep on believing in good intentions. The people wanted transformation. If you were not about to accommodate the wishes, Mr. Talbot, you had to be a sacrificial victim, your own people, and the people who show no sympathy, and they show no sympathy. Please, please, for the young men and women who are part of the two-way party, I think you have to do a serious introspection of the shortcomings that brought us to where we are today. We wanted elections. We are Democrats. Even we are revolutionary Democrats. Like those you believe in in America, the founding fathers. We are Democrats. We wanted elections. And I said to you, yeah, we were convinced that election in 82, we could have won such elections. But it was you, it was you, who thought you could gamble with violence. You gamble. And you know what happened to gamblers? Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. <laughs> Serious, you lost. You lost. And that explains our tragedy. Thank you. In summary, I understand that what you're telling me is that we regrettably lacked righteous leaders at that transitional point. Because just as you said, uh, why didn't Talbot or the Chui party make a change? They couldn't have. They were filled with the inertia of their history of 100 years of selfish rule. So the change had to come from those who were making the initiative to change. They should have had the wisdom to know better. Like you said, Mr. Mark Matthews maybe didn't have that and he was naive in just trying to approach a system with people who thought, he, where he thought they would have just, you know, naturally given up. But that was a naive approach. But others like yourself and others who have that understanding of the historical struggle somehow would have felt there should be an understanding and a clearer plan. Because if somebody else even had offered the sacrifice of Talbot, let's say he became a sacrificial lamb, but somebody else offered that sacrifice, the transition into a peaceful Liberia would have been smooth if it had not been for the fact that you take someone from a difficult environment full of resentment and, and, and concern about being not given any hope in life and you put that person in a position of power and seat, it's not easy. So that was just my, my yeah. thought of reflection when I asked that question. That's but but, but uh, Commissioner, let me, let me say something about that. And it's very interesting. We, know, we must not put on the blinkers of policemen. It was not told, but he was symbolic of a system. He represented an oligarchy. And what I've been trying to say to you and others is that you say, me, myself, a boy, my family. This was a man who was demonized. There was not a time when he was, I was even called or any of my people to say, can we discuss about the future of Liberia? We were hounded. 
security people in the classroom not to listen to our lectures but to hear information. Now, if these people were suffering from historical inertia, they couldn't move, then probably we should ask ourselves the question. If they couldn't move, then what gave them? What gave them the audacity to feel that those who were on the street agitating could be silenced, could be silenced with guns and bayonets? It's a simple question. The people were paralyzed. So what gave them that God? What, I mean, what boldness? You can say one thing you don't want to say. They were not naive. They were probably politically stupid. Or they were so arrogant. So arrogant. That they felt that after a hundred years of putting down protests, they were capable of doing it. And let me say this. There were people in the society who kept preaching. I don't agree. Don't even look at the political actors. The man who was right here, Reverend Tim Maurice, I listened to his sermon every Sunday from the time I came home in 78. This noble man using his religion was talking against the injustice in the society. All the religious leaders all over, all over, were preaching, listening to the people. You, Mr. Talbot, you are a religious man yourself. You know your Bible. It's like the story I heard of a man who was deeply religious. He went swimming. Always worship God. This man went swimming. And he had a cramp. He was drowning. And then the man came with a speedboat. Say, no, get on the speedboat. Get on the speedboat. He said, no, 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 I believe in my God. You know, Jesus walk on water. I will get out of this place. You go. He's struggling in the water after five minutes, a helicopter. They threw down the ladder. Get up. He said, no, 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 go. I believe in my righteous God. And things will be all right. When he looked, a very strong man came out swimming. Swimming. He said, hold on to me. He said, I don't want you. My Lord will protect me. So the man got the man drowned and he went to heaven. He said, God, you know, I worship you all the time. I pray. I go to church. I pay my arms. I was drowning. I call on you. You never rescue me. The Lord said, I sent a boat. You drove it away. I sent a helicopter. You drove that away. I sent a strong man. Don't you understand that I have those who have themselves? <laughs> Here was Mr. Talbot. A graduate of Cottington, I think. An educated man. In relationship with Ahmed Secretary of Guinea. Here was a man who was traveling around Africa. Who understood what was happening in Africa. Because his government, like Topman, provided passports to African freedom fighters, like Mandela and others. Here was a man who understood the world. He had young technocrats around him. Brilliant men. On the other side, religious leaders, saying that we are listening to the cries of the people. On one side, these so-called people you're called, they call noisemakers, agitating. And you are telling me that these people did not understand what was happening in society? No, I think they understood. They understood. But you know, there's a problem with arrogance. Arrogance makes you feel superhuman. It makes you feel that you know everything. And you know what they say. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. They had the opportunity. Go, young people, young people, go and read the resolution from the Basa con Congress or the Tui Party. See what the youthful members of the Tui Party stipulated in that document. Why did they not listen? Let me tell you a simple story. We were, monitor we were monitoring very keenly the Bikana Congress. We said the Tui Party can pull a fast one on us. They can come out with something that will take the raw from on us. 
All they had to do was to make Jackson Doe Secretary 